Hey guys, what's up? This is Brett. Welcome to this week's episode of Friday on the Turntable. Huge thank you to all my subscribers and uh, everyone that caught my last video that I did with my friend Jesse where we ranked the entire Depeche Mode catalog. Had a blast doing that one and really enjoyed all of the comments and lists you guys sent back of your favorite albums. So, huge thank you guys. So today I am talking about Iggy Pop's 1977 classic, The Idiot. One of my favorite albums of all time right here. And um, I've been really anxious to talk about this album. It's been on the queue for a long time and uh, I had just secured a copy of this on, on the vinyl from VC member Michael Mayer. So thank you Michael for uh, finding a copy of this for me. Just got it for a couple dollars so was very happy and uh, thus here comes the video. So 1977, the year of release of this album. So let's talk about five other albums that came out from that year. There, these ones are all connected to the idiot in some way. Never mind the bollocks. Here come. Here, never mind the bollocks. Here's the Sex Pistols. 1977, punk rock, uh, hugely influenced by what Iggy Pop did in the uh, late 60s, early 70s with the Stooges. Uh, Kraftwerk's Trans Euro Express. German electronic pioneers. Um, this had an influence on the sound, or this band had an influence on the sound of the idiot, as we will discuss here pretty soon. And here's a couple other ones. David Bowie's Low, 1977. I'm showing you my CD because those of you that follow me on Facebook, you'll notice that uh, in the background of all of my posts, uh, you'll see the cover of Low Frame, so I did not want to dismantle that frame to show it. So David Bowie's Low. Another one from Iggy Pop actually, Lust for Life, 1977, and another one from David Bowie, Heroes, also 1977. So it just goes to show that David Bowie and Iggy Pop released several albums in 1977, and uh, it's known that that time period was Bowie's Berlin era and Berlin trilogy, but what a lot of people don't realize is there were more than just three albums from David Bowie in the 1977 to 79 period besides Low Heroes and Lodger. There is Iggy Pop's The Idiot and Lust for Life, which Bowie had a heavy hand in the creation of, co-wrote um, mostly all, if not all, of the songs and uh, produced them as well. So when you think of the, how prolific that time period was, it's just pretty mesmerizing in the quality of work that came out. So The Idiot released in, uh, it was March 18th, 1977. Iggy Pop's first album since kind of the dissolution of the, uh, the Stooges in 1973, so the world really hadn't heard anything from him uh, from Raw Power from 73, which Bowie was brought in to mix that album. And when you think about the sound, if you're familiar with The Idiot, and you think about the sound of the Stooges' Raw Power, it is a complete 180 degree turnaround. The influences of German music, like the Krautrock sound of bands like Noi and Kraftwerk, mixed with this kind of icy Euro funk and that just comes together in this just really cool juxtaposition that's on the idiot and then it's explored even further on Bowie's Low and Heroes. So they're all, all intertwined. So around this time period of the recording of the album, Bowie and Iggy Pop were both kind of deep, I guess you could say deep within some uh, addiction and to escape what uh, the media attention of Bowie's career and his problems, uh, you know, living in LA. And um, so him, he took Iggy and they uh, headed off to Europe to escape from that. And uh, like I said earlier, became just such a, a, a time period of prolific songwriting. Um, so the album was actually recorded in France where Bowie recorded uh, Pin Ups, his all covers album back in 1973. And then uh, some additional overdub work was done in at Giorgio Moroder, uh, his studio in Munich. And then the final mix was done at the Hansa by the Wall Studios in Berlin, where uh, the album then and the successive albums get their name, you know, as being part of the Berlin era. Um, so that's where the album was mixed. And um, it had the musicians that are on The Idiot 
uh, were musicians that comprised Bowie's band, some of them dating back to 75 for the Young Americans album and tour. And then most of all of them were on Station to Station and that tour. And then they and, uh, continued to play with Bowie all the way through Scary Monsters, and some of them remained for years. But so you had Carlos Alomar on guitar, who was one of the co-writers of the opening track, Sister Midnight, which was a song that Bowie was actually playing live on the Station to Station tour. And it was reworked with uh, Iggy Pop uh, singing and I think different lyrics for that. Uh, Dennis Davis was on drums and George Murray on bass. And then a guy from Magma, Laurent uh, Thibault, played bass, and he was the owner of the studio that they recorded at in France, the Chateau, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name, De Heroville in, in France. And then a, a studio guitar player named Phil Palmer was, was also um, recorded a lot of the guitar tracks. And Bowie played a plethora of instruments on that one. You can hear him on backing vocals. Um, so let's see here. There really wasn't any true uh, singles from this album. There was a US promo uh, seven inch for, I think it was, what was it? Sister Midnight. And it was had a really limited release in a couple markets. I think Australia and uh, somewhere in Europe. And then China Girl had just a limited UK and Spain single. But, um, but the album is so widely covered by various artists. Um, Oh, I should also mention that Sister Midnight was actually, the music for it was reworked on uh, Bowie's Lodger album. I think it was the closing track. Is it uh, Red Money? Someone will correct me on that one, but it's the same backing, pretty much the same musical backing track, just with a whole different vocal part and melody. So getting back to the covers, this album is so widely covered by various artists. Night Clubbing, Grace Jones, um, Human League. Uh, Peter Murphy did a version with Trent Reznor in the studio, uh, and that song has just a special attachment to me. It's one of my favorite tracks. Uh, it has just such that, almost like this little, just this shuffling dance beat with just these really icy, processed guitar um, little bits that just come in and out. And just, I, I, I just go back, you know, to years you know before going out to clubs that night with my brother or preparing you know getting ready to go to an Audra performance when we were um, you know uh, on tour or whatever and putting that song as we were getting ready for the show and it just was this pump up song night clubby we night just great a uh, fun time from this album was recorded it was released uh, Peter Murphy did a cover it on love hysteria uh, boy George REM did versions of it China girl that uh, Bowie actually did his own uh, cover version of his own song with, um, and released it on the Let's Dance album in 1983. And it's a much more slick, polished version uh, compared to the uh, more raucous version by uh, uh, on, the, on The Idiot. But the band James did a great version of that one as a B-side. And uh, one of the great moments on the album, probably my favorite moment, is during China Girl. Uh, the dynamics of the vocals. There's a part where uh, Iggy's vocals get so loud um, that he actually clips the mic, and clipping is like a studio term for when you just over overwhelm the microphone, where it just has a, a distort. It distorts, and he does that. It's in the way, and it's just it gets just so loud, and it's just so killer, and it's my favorite moment on on the album. But as I said earlier, it's it's. I think this album is just perfection. It had a huge influence on uh, the band Joy Division. You can really hear it on Unknown Pleasures and Closer, Closer, their two studio albums. And you know, I hate to bring this up, just but it's just a known um, a known element that this was the last album that was uh, Ian Curtis had listened to before he took his own life. It's it's been documented, and it was in the the um, the a biopic that came out uh, closer on um, on Ian Curtis's life, so just kind of a sad thing. I always, whenever I think of this album, I all, that always pops into my head. Um, so a couple other things I wanted to show you guys. There is an excellent book on this time period of Bowie and Iggy Pop's career, and it was put out by uh, Jawbone Press. And I did a review on it on my blog a couple years back uh, after I contacted the uh, publisher, Jawbone, and they sent me a copy to review. And uh, it's just 
great. It is uh, Bowie in Berlin, A New Career in a New Town by Thomas Jerome Seabrook. I'll have a link down in the description box where you can check this out and purchase through, uh, through that link because for any Bowie fans or Iggy Pop, this is essential reading because, you know, it's not a whole career overview. It's a microcosm of like his life and his, you know, his career from 76 to 79. You know, it kind of touches on some prelude up to it and after it, but man, it's just so documents this time period. And there's a great, let me see if I can quickly, quickly find it here because it was just one of the best photos that I've ever seen of uh, Bowie. And it's him in, uh, they're in Copenhagen, him and Iggy Pop, and they're waiting at the train station incognito there, and I just love that photo. But it's it's a, a great book, tracing that time period, talking about the recording sessions and the tours, and uh, just highly recommended. Link in the description box. I only get to, I've only seen Iggy Pop once. I had a, fr I'm a, a good friend of mine, Larry, got, uh, he's from Ohio, and he actually got to see Iggy Pop on the tour. I think it was for the idiot when they came through, um, I'm, I think it was Cleveland. And it was when Bowie was actually in the band as the keyboard, uh, keyboard player, which would have been just monumental to see that. And uh, so Larry got to see that. I got to see Iggy Pop in 2001, April 25th. It was at a venue in Scottsdale, Arizona called the Cajun House. And uh, there's my ticket, which I, I saved. And uh, he was just a monster on the stage, just a madman, shirt off, just own the stage. I think Ron Ashton was guitar the guitar player who was in the Stooges with him, recently passed away. But it was a killer show. He was just all over the place, and it was just, uh, yeah, great to, great to see him. So I think that wraps it up. Um, Iggy Pop the Idiot, I can't recommend this enough. This is just a landmark album and uh, really took a, a, you know, a, a cool turn in Iggy Pop's career and just showed it a completely different side, uh, side to him. So uh, you guys see this out, CD, cassette, vinyl, download, buy it, you get my approval. So anyways guys, thanks for watching. I will talk to you guys soon.